Let me clarify this for you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word khitbah, which means the engagement. In Islam, an engagement is only a confirmation that the two of us are going to get married. That is already an engagement. There is no party, there is no distribution of sweets, there is no nothing. All that is excess, it is culture, and it is something that sometimes we make life difficult through. The mere fact that two people have now, two families have agreed that we are going to get married, inshallah, or the two are going to get married, you are already engaged, subhanallah. There is nothing like an engagement ring in Islam. All that is extra, it's excess. And people who do it, if they do it just out of happiness, inshallah, it should be okay. But if they do it thinking that it's a must, hey, we're engaged, where's my ring? Otherwise, I'm going to break this engagement. If that's the case, you don't need to marry that woman. Believe me, because when you marry, she will ask you for your pay packet the day you get your salary. Allahu Akbar. And one day when your salary is less, she might even instruct you to move out of the house. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. The hadith speaks about marriage and says, some of the marriages that are the most blessed are those that the least amount of wealth is used, least extravagance. You know, when we have marriages, we are taught to have a simple marriage. Why? Because it is an act of worship. Marriages are acts of worship. And this is why when we have our functions of walima, a walima is the function out of happiness. It is an act of worship that we have either at the hall or at the home. We must make sure that we do not engage in earning the anger of Allah. Marriage is half of your iman, according to one of the narrations. The walima or that party is a celebration of half of your iman. If you are celebrating half of your iman by allowing women to come into the gathering who are not even dressed properly or the bride herself is half naked and the groom wants to sit with the females, then you are celebrating half of your iman by pleasing shaitan. Your marriage won't work. It will not work. I guarantee that. Also, if you have had, for example, a function where there is a mixed gathering of male and female mixing and dining and whining, and everything haram happening. In that case, we are celebrating half of our Iman. Let's think how we have just did that. We need to engage in Tawbah, some of us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive our shortcomings. Some who are already married have already done that. Now do you know why you had problems in your marriage? May Allah protect us. Because the seed, when it was sown, you, you watered it with urine. May Allah protect us. And that is a very strict statement. It's very harsh, but it's a reality. Believe me, it makes us boil when we think of how people will please shaitan. May Allah not make us from that. And they won't listen to any of the ulama. They won't understand. Shaitan wants to contaminate you from the very celebration of half of your iman. That is why you'd rather not have the function if you would like to have it in a manner that will please shaitan. Feed two people at your house, that is enough. Feed the poor in an orphanage, that is enough. But if you would like to have gatherings where everyone besides Allah is going to be happy, only shaitan will be worshipped, then that is not the way to celebrate half of your iman. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open the doors for us. Marriage is one of the most important things everybody looks towards and looks forward to from a very early age and this is why it is a reality we need to discuss it and we need to spend our time in this regard i think every single one of us if ever we are getting married or we know of someone getting married or one of our children is getting married let us instruct them and let us try and teach them to have that function or that party totally separated gathering within the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like we are in the masjid, we are totally separated. That is also an act of worship which is celebrating half of your iman. We lose it and we think it's a party. Immediately after the party, they go on honeymoon, they come back separated. May Allah protect us all. It is increasing because most people, even the most religious of people, when it comes to their functions, sometimes what they do, they compromise what is right and wrong. And if that is the case, how are we going to earn the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We want children, we want offspring. The seed we sowed from day one was already wrong. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never do that to us. This is why the nikah, the sunnah is to have it in the masjid, in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because it is the most blessed of places. It is the, not the house of the president, nor the most expensive house around. Mashallah, on the day of happiness, yes, we are allowed to be happy. We wear new clothes and we wear this and we wear that. For the brides, the message is never ever wear something that will reveal your body the day you are going for that function because that body 
is a gift for your husband and not for the rest of humanity. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. So these are statements that require digestion. They are solid, they are serious, and they are common sense. Really, they are instructions from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Marriage is a gift. It is a holy union. It is a noble coming together of two individuals to increase the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We need to treat it like an act of worship, I think, inshallah. Remember, if you've erred in the past already, we need to engage in tawbah and istighfar. Allah is most forgiving. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is most forgiving, most merciful. But we will not promote vice. And we will never ever swallow words of justice when we have to utter them just to please people. Another thing I'd like to bear in mind and, and I'd like everybody to bear it in mind is that it is prohibited for us to attend a function where haram is going to happen even if it is the nikah of your own father or brother or son or sister or uncle or aunt. You will not attend in order not to be from amongst those who have made shaitan happy when someone is supposed to be celebrating half of their iman. My brothers and sisters, there came a time the second year after the hijrah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wherein Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu was married to the daughter of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, known as Fatima binti Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So what exactly happened? Well, when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked him, O oh Ali, what do you have? You want to marry my daughter? But what do you have to give her in terms of a mahar? Now you and I would know that mahar is not a dowry in every sense of the meaning of the term dowry. It is a gift that is given from the groom to the bride. And that is something that Islam has stipulated in order for us to acknowledge the status of a woman and the fact that the male is primarily responsible for the upkeep or for looking after the women and for spending on them, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us. Primarily the man is supposed to be the breadwinner. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knew that this man does not own a home. He's not a wealthy man. He doesn't have much, but he gave him his daughter. This is a lesson for us all. Today, when you want to get married, first thing you do is you ask the man, what do you have? What type of a job do you have? What car do you drive? Do you have a house? How much is your salary? What figure do you have? If not, we fight with the daughter and say, not this man. He's not good enough. Not realizing that our own fathers, and I'm sure those whom I'm speaking to today, our fathers or grandfathers, when they got married, they were much happier than we are. And they married those who had absolutely no house, no shoes sometime. They were just honest, upright, pious people. And they were people who the, the fathers of the girls knew that this person is so honest and so responsible that he will look after my daughter, even if he doesn't have something right now. But he's a responsible man. So they let them get married. They were happier than those in our generation who look for money prior to you getting married. So how is it? You will only be married at the age of 40, my beloved brother, because that is when you will own a house. May Allah make it easy for us to look at the lesson of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an. He married the daughter of the greatest of all, Fatima binti Muhammad radiallahu anha. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam loved his daughter so much. Do you think he would have given his daughter to someone who really had absolutely nothing? According to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ali ibn Abi Talib had a lot. He had iman. He was an upright youngster. He grew up with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So his character and his religion were of a very, very high level, if not one of the highest. This is what is to be looked at to this day. If someone comes to marry your daughter, they have good character and conduct and a high level of deen, let them get married. Subhanallah, let them get married. From this we learn that those who choose to look at wealth and wealth alone and status in society and status alone, a lot of the times they doom their daughters into great depression. Yet they just want to save their names. That's why they got them married there. May Allah protect us. It's not always the case, but it is happening more often today than ever before. May Allah grant us the ability to seek guidelines from the messenger we claim to love so much. Here is he. This is what he did with Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says, Oh Ali, what do you have? He says, I have nothing. He says, Oh Ali, 
you have an armor. The armor that you have. What about that? He said, yes, I do have the armor. He said, well, you can sell the armor and give the amount to my daughter. So he did not say pay me for my daughter and you need to pay my, the rest of my family and bring gifts and we need to have a night before you get married that will be even bigger than the marriage itself and we need to start celebrating in this way and that way. It was something so simple. He said, oh Ali, that is the dira, that is the armor. I have now married you to my daughter and that will be the mahar. That will be the amount that you will give as a gift to my own daughter. They were married and they, the ceremony was not even what we would see today. It was something that was an agreement between them. They had the witnesses that were there, simple occasion. And this was one of the most blessed of all marriages ever. May Allah grant us ease. So listen to what Ali ibn Abi Talib did. He went out to the market to sell his armor. So Uthman ibn Affan, who was married to the other daughter of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So these are now brothers-in-law, right? So he says, Oh Ali, what are you doing? He says, I'm here to sell my dira, to sell my armor, because I am about to marry the daughter of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Fatima. Uthman was so happy. He said, can I pay you for it? What do you want? He says, I want 400 dirhams. He says, okay, no problem. Here is the 400. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. He paid him a certain amount. Some say 400, some say 480 little gold coins. So that would be dinanir, dinars. So what happened is he paid him the amount and when he took the armor and Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu took the amount, Uthman ibn Affan calls him back and says, Oh Ali, this is a gift from me to you. Here is an armor. You can have this. Subhanallah. So he went back with the armor and with the 400 as well. Subhanallah. And he went to give it and he told Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about what Uthman ibn Affan had done. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was so delighted and so happy. Imagine these were now family members related to one another. They had big hearts. May Allah grant us ease. Today, a father will not help his own son with 400 gold coins. Believe me. Today, people who are married to two sisters might not even want to look at each other. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. About the etiquette of the wedding night. Um, the sunnah that we have, is that when you marry a woman, the sunnah is that you put your hand over her forehead and you say, Bismillah, O oh Allah, I ask you from whatever good she is created on and I ask you her goodness and I seek refuge in you from any evil she was created on and I seek for, uh, refuge in you from her evil. So this is the first thing you do because this initiates a happy life when you ask Allah Azza wa to bless your wife for you and to uh, uh, protect you from any evil that she has. And also, some scholars say that among the etiquettes, not only on the wedding night, but throughout the whole night, that you pray two rak'ahs with your wife. And this is a sunnah rarely you would find uh, spouses doing. So the sunnah is that every single night you wake your wife up or she wakes you up and you pray two rak'ah together in congregation and Allah would register you among the dhakirin Allah kathiran with dhakirat, those who remember Allah a lot and plenty, males and females. So this is what you should try your level best to uh, uh, do. As for the intercourse, then the, there is a dua where the Prophet says, Asam, whoever says before having intimacy with his wife, Bismillah, Allahumma jannibna shaytan, wa jannib shaytan ma razaqtana, Bismillah in the name of Allah, O oh Allah, protect us from Satan and protect what you have blessed us from Satan as well. So uh, uh, if you say this, then Allah Azza wa Jal would grant you a son, uh, inshallah, or an offspring of yours that uh, the shaytan would not be able to seduce or lure uh, uh, with the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal. And there are uh, other things, but I believe that this inshallah uh, suffices.